Thank you, Pastor Nick. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Robbins, and it's great to be here. Amen. Uh, nothing gives me greater pleasure than to study and now speak about the Word. I'm, I'm really excited about the topic. Um, as Pastor Nick said, we're splitting tonight, so I'm really going to try and keep my piece down to 15 minutes if Pastor Nick has the full 15 minutes for his. Uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. I, uh, as I said, Brian Robbins, I'm a Jewish believer. I came to faith in 2005, and I was baptized right here at Harvest Time Church, although technically speaking at the Boys Club in Greenwich, but by, uh, by Harvest Time Church in 2006. Um, my walk of faith 2006 has been interesting. I've studied a lot of doctrine. I've uh, visited a lot of faith communities. Um, I've been blessed by many graces by the Holy Spirit, for which I'm tremendously thankful. And the Holy Spirit brought me back here home to Harvest Time Church, where I'm delighted to be. Um, my testimony is pretty remarkable, so maybe someday I can tell a real story. But I think the most powerful part about my testimony was before I came to faith, I had no interest in, nor had I ever read, the Word. And when I came to faith on December 23rd, 2005, something happened to me. And since that day, I do not exaggerate, a day has not gone by where I haven't either studied or meditated on the Word. And that's why I'm so excited to talk about the Bible today. So let's get right into it, because that's what it is. What is the Bible? I, I brought my copy. This happens to be an NIV, a good translation, but there are many good ones. The Bible is a lot of things. It's, of course, it's God's Word. And we're going to talk about that. But it it's life's playbook. It's God's, next to Jesus Christ, it is God's greatest gift to us. It is his word. It is our source of consolation. It is our source of meditation. It's where we go when we're in times of trouble. It's where we go when we're looking for answers and we don't know where to find them. They're here. And it's a tremendous gift. And um, I spent a lot of time talking to both believers and non-believers. I just love to talk about God. And when I talk to, uh, to non-believers, who say, well, I believe kind of in God, but, you know, they know what the book, you know, whether the Jewish or the Torah or the Christian scriptures, they say, well, I never really read it. And the challenge, you know, for somebody like that that I always lay out there is, gee, you know, when you live and you've lived 90 years, 100 years, and you die and you believe in God, you meet God, and he said, what do you think about my book? And they said, well, I didn't have time to get to it. That's a bad, that's a bad hair day. Um, <laughs> the word Bible, we call it the Bible, but um, that actually comes from a Greek word uh, called Biblia. Um, the word Bible didn't come into fashion into the time of Wycliffe around the time of the Reformation, uh, but it's been adopted. And so we call it the Bible uh, for our Jewish brethren who only, when we going to talk about the Old Testament versus the New Testament, they call it the Torah. Well, the first five books were the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, but uh, Christians, we tend to call it the Bible. Um, it is comprised of 66 books. Um, there were approximately 40 authors, and the Bible was written over 1,500 years. Of course, there's only one divine author, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. But it's a pretty remarkable piece of literature, um, even for a non-believer. And for, for those of us who believe, it is our foundation. It is our cornerstone. It is how we get to know who Jesus is and who God is. And it's how we get to know who we are, because um, it's tremendously revealing. The Old Testament... Um, again, our Jewish brethren will call them the Hebrew Scriptures, um, but we tend to call it the Old Testament is comprised of 39 books. Uh, the New Testament is comprised of 27 books, thus 66 books. So who wrote the Bible? Well, the Old Testament, the 39 books, were written by the prophets and leaders of the nation of Israel. Um, and most, virtually all of that was written in Hebrew, although there were some passages that were written in Aramaic, another ancient language that was common. In fact, in Yeshua, Jesus' day, they spoke as a vernacular Aramaic as well as Hebrew and then in the local area Greek. Um, the New Testament was written by the apostles and those closely associated with the apostles. Again, written mostly, if not entirely, in Greek. We don't really know because, with, I don't know if you realize it, we don't have any of the original scriptures in existence today. We have very, very old copies. So there's some speculation, but it's just speculation that perhaps maybe Matthew or some of the books may have been written in Hebrew and translated to Greek, but we don't know. So either all are mostly written in Greek. Uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, you'll hear it thrown around, are, again, Jewish friends will call it the Torah. That's what it is. The first five books is the Torah, also called the five books of Moses, also called the Pentateuch. And uh, interestingly, if you remember from the New Testament scriptures, 
there's a description of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And amongst various debates between those groups, between resurrection and not, uh, another distinction was the Sadducees believed only that the, that the first five books of Moses, the Torah, was the word of God and really didn't subscribe to the balance of the Hebrew scriptures as being the word. But the Pharisees believed that the entire 39 books of the Hebrew scriptures were the word of God, um, very much consistent with what we, obviously consistent with what we believe. Um, in that Old Testament, what does it tell us? It's a, there's a history of Israel there. It includes great books of wisdom, the Psalms which are tremendously com uh, comforting. Proverbs, great books of, of wisdom. Uh, the major prophets and the minor prophets, uh, un uncommonly, major doesn't mean better, it just means they wrote more words. So the major prophets really are the first few prophets that wrote the biggest testaments in their, you know, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah would be major prophets and the balance of them would be called minor prophets. Uh, the Old Testament kicks us off. It starts with creation and it covers all the way up to 400 years before the time of Christ. So the topic's covered in the Old Testament. I encourage you to read it, but it's a big book, Creation of the Universe, and we're going to talk about creation next week. The Fall of Man, we're going to talk about fall next week too. The Judgment of the Flood over the Earth, that's Noah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great patriarchs of the Jewish faith and ultimately of the Christian faith. Israel in Egypt, that's, that's actually a good opera too. But, um, and that's telling the story of Joseph's, uh, you know, being coming uh, number two to Pharaoh and then ultimately our bondage in e Egypt. And that's a very powerful story because it's the exodus from Egypt, which really foreshadows Jesus is freeing us from the redemption, redeeming us from sin. So a very powerful story. Uh, entering to the promised land, the land of Canaan, the period of the judges, you know, Samson, remember that story? Uh, the United Kingdom under Saul and then fulfilled in a really united way under David and then for Solomon for a brief period of time. The divided kingdom, when Solomon's son wasn't such a good guy, and it led to the splitting up of the ten northern tribes of Israel from the two southern tribes of Israel. The exile in Babylon, and that actually followed the exile in Assyria, where we lost the first ten tribes of Israel. The return and building of the land for 140 years. The prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, my favorite part of the Old Testament. And the prophecy of the end times. And a lot of people don't realize it, but if you put Daniel and Ezekiel together, you have the book of Revelation, almost. Um, there's a transition issue between the Old Testament and the New. There is a compilation of books called the Septuagint. Um, when the Jews were in exile, about 200 B.C., before the time of Christ, and they were under basically Alexander the Great and basically the Greeks, um, Alexander commissioned 70 or 72, depending who you ask, great Orthodox rabbis to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. In fact, we know from scholarly research that many of the quotations in the New Testament grammatically came from the Septuagint translation, the Greek, which made sense because they were speaking Greek at the time of the apostles. But interestingly, in the Septuagint, there were 14 additional books than what are in the Hebrew scriptures today. Um, they were never accepted by the Jews as part of the canon because uh, Orthodox Jews believe, and we also believe, that there was no prophet in Israel for the 400 years before the time of Christ. Although seven of those books, just as a detail, found their way into the Catholic Bible, and they're called the Apocrypha. Uh, and those were uh, not uniformly accepted in the early church, and then were formally rejected by the Protestants during the Reformation, and at the same time formally accepted by the Catholics. So that's for a distinction between a Catholic Bible and a Protestant Bible, seven extra books in the Old Testament. Um, the most remarkable prophecies in the Old Testament for me, and it's hard to pick two because it's such a great book, uh, but I want to read them because they're so powerful. One, it all starts in Genesis. Right in, the, right in Genesis, we learn about Jesus. I love it. The very first book of the Bible. And it says in Genesis 3.15, I'm reading NIV, and I would put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And actually there, I prefer a non-NIV translation. I prefer the translation of offspring there to seed. And it's very powerful because women don't have seed. And of course, Jesus was born of Mary. Very interesting, striking. The ultimate fulfillment of that very mysterious passage is what? How can Mary have seed? Only men have seed because Mary gives birth without male seed. A really prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And then, of course, there's Isaiah 53. My, one of my favorite verses from there. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. If that's not Jesus Christ, I don't know what they were talking about. The New Testament uh, starts with the four Gospels, as you know. Uh, you know, powerful message there. It's where we learn about the identity and ministry of Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. Acts 
is the establishment of the church. The 21 epistles are the teachings of Jesus and the church. And it's where we go to learn our doctrine. And of course, Revelation, the great picture of what's in store for us as believers. And again, hearkening back to the book of Daniel and the book of Ezekiel. Um, there are a lot of themes people can draw from the Bible. There are five that leap out at me, but the, not the only five. But if you read the Bible as a story, and I really believe it's a coherent story, throughout the old and the new, consistent message, the character of God, judgment for sin and disobedience, the blessing for faith, for faith and obedience, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, and his sacrifice for sin, and the coming kingdom and glory. So how do we get the Bible? It's a great book. How do we get it? Well, we believe that the Bible is a revelation of God that he documented in the Holy Scriptures by inspiring these great authors whom I alert, referred to to write his word. But it's really his word. It wasn't a dictation. God used these men as instruments with their own style of writing, their own character, their own cultural you know, uses of the words, but to convey his message perfectly. Every word is of God, but it's not dictation. It's a great paradox, but that's what we believe. It says in the Bible, because the Bible testifies to itself in 2 Timothy 3.16, again NIV, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We also read in 2 Peter 1.20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, what's this canon thing we read about? I mean, how do we know that the 66 birds books I referred to that are in this Bible here are all there is. How come there's not 75 or how come there's not 52 or 47? As I said, we think there were 40, approximately 40 authors, authors of this book. Well, the canon was determined through a bunch of guiding principles. So when I say determined, nobody said this is the canon. It was received. In other words, we relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us into the, who, the, who, who wrote the books and whether they were from God. But there are a couple of characteristics, I think, that were taken into account. One is, in every book, the author is either a prophet or an apostle or somebody closely associated with them. So if you didn't fall into that category, you were kind of out of luck. Um, any writing of Scripture, since God cannot contravene God, Jesus is the same yesterday and today forever, amen, Hebrews? So writings could not contravene scripture. So if there was a great groovy looking book and it sounded really good, but it had you know, some teaching that was inconsistent with something that was otherwise recognized as scripture, was not qualified to be considered scripture. And finally, and most importantly, um, the writing would be recognized by the consensus of the church as part of the canon. And what I mean by that is, again, the greatest testament that we have the right testament. <laughs> is that it has prevailed, that it has endured, and that the somehow this col collection, and I'll, I know I'm running out of time here, somehow this collection of individuals uh, all sharing the same faith reached a consensus on the canon. Um, when did this happen? The Old Testament canon was accepted by the Jews more or less in its current form, 39 books, by the time of Jesus, although there's some historical belief, a reason to believe that it was formally adopted or recognized in a council of Jamnia in 90 AD. But around the time of Jesus, the, the Hebrew scriptures were already recognized by the Jews as being canonical. I mentioned the Apocrypha before. I won't need to go into it again. Um, interesting, though, I will point out that even though I mentioned that Jesus and the apostles quoted often from the Septuagint, that Greek translation, there is not a single instance where they quoted from any of those Apocryphal books. So every quote in the New Testament comes from the 66, well, from the 39 books in the Hebrew Scriptures that are part of our 66 book New Testament. Uh, the New Testament, um, you know, ultimately, uh, don't forget, there was no Bible when the apostles were teaching. They were teaching. They were writing. They, they were teaching orally. It got written down. Um, but the canon, as we know it, the 27 books were adopted effectively by consensus by the middle of the fourth century, between 350 and 400 and never really questioned, had never questioned. So there's been a 
unanimous understanding across the entire Christian family, I would say, of the 27 books of the New Testament. And as I indicated earlier in the Old Testament, there's uniformity, almost without exception, amongst the Protestant world, and, the, and there's Catholics that have a dis disagreement over seven books in the Apocrypha. Um, how do we have confidence that the, the word will endure? Well, because God told us. I love these verses. In Isaiah 48, God wrote, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. He also wrote in 1 Peter 1.25, But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this the, wor and this the word that was preached to you. Again, in Psalm 119.89, God writes, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And finally, in Isaiah 59.21, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you, and my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time and forever, says the Lord. The New Testament literally has thousands of manuscripts. We have them. As I said, we don't have the originals, but we have thousands of manuscripts dating back to within a few centuries of Christ. And what's remarkable, don't forget these were all written by hand, separated by centuries. There is remarkable consistency amongst the translations and the, 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 the copies of those manuscripts. Uh, so we have very strong confidence and every reason to have confidence that what we have is a legitimate Bible. Um, and the Old Testament, similarly, um, until recently, we, we had copies only going back to, you know, to about a thousand, about a thousand years. Um, but then they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls you may have read about. Those date to before Christ, 200 B.C. And the Dead Sea Scrolls have complete books of virtually every book in the Hebrew Scriptures. There's only one or two exceptions. And with remarkable accuracy, the Hebrew Scriptures we have today compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls are virtually identical and absolutely identical in all matters of doctrine. The last thing I'll mention about Scripture is important to know. We take the Bible to be the inerrant and infallible Word of God but when we say that, we mean the original, okay? You know, there are translations. So this is a very good NIV translation. I like it. It's kind of easy to read. It's a literal translation. But this is a translation. And you might be reading a New King James. I think they gave that out today. Another great translation, by the way. But the words are going to be a little bit different. And you might read a New Living Translation, which is not really necessarily a little translation, but kind of a translation in concept. Or you might read The Message, right, which a lot of people like to read, which is kind of very easy to read, but it's not a literal translation. So we don't take those to be infallible. We take, I don't take this to be infallible. I take the original word of God to be infallible. This is pretty darn, this is pretty good. And when I do serious study of the Bible, if there's a question of doctrine that somebody's debating with me, I'll go to a reverse interlinear Bible and I'll read it in Hebrew or I'll read it in Greek. Um, and the beautiful thing today is you don't have to actually know Hebrew or Greek to be able to do that. There are resources available to all of us if you really want to get into the word and get into the accuracy of the translations that we're working with. So with that, Pastor Nick, is that, did I take too much time? We're good? So uh, look, I, as I said, the Bible is, is a treasure. I mean, I, I can't put it any other way. Uh, nothing lights up my life more than spending time in this word, thinking about it. And it's like an onion. It really is like an onion. The more you read this, the more layers you pull back, the more you see. And um, what's so amazing about that is that it, it, it's, God, it's still the same God speaking to us with the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet we see different things in different ways through different lens. So, again, I'm quite excited to be here, and thank you for letting me share with you this little bit. Thank you so much, Brian. That was awesome. That was good. I th and if you've ever had to do that in 15 minutes, you'll know just how good that was. I think he's going, uh, we have water and coffee back there, brother, but no oxygen. So <laughs> you're on your own for that. All right. Um, a third question that we want to share tonight about the Bible and think about is how do we know the Bible is reliable? How do we know that it is reliable? Well, first, because of its accuracy. We know the Bible is reliable because of its accuracy. The Bible is accurate in everything that it asserts, and no one has ever found a true inaccuracy in it. There's historical accuracy to the Bible. 
The Bible gives us numerous historical details that were actually unknown for centuries, or in many cases even flat out denied by secular historians until what happened ultimately was the Bible was proven to be accurate and history was proven to be wrong. Uh, Christians know, for example, how Jesus was crucified under the Roman leader Pontius Pilate. But what few people remember today because it's embarrassing is that there was no archaeological evidence that a person named Pontius Pilate ever existed until 1966. That was the first time Pilate's name, the name of Pilate, was ever found carved on anything. He was only referred to before that in the Bible and in a few other writings. And so because of that, skeptics said, ah, there wasn't even any such a person as Pilate. But the Bible was right. Another famous example was that of the Hittites. You know, in the Bible, there were all these ites that the children of Israel were fighting all the time, right? And the Hittites were a Middle Eastern people who were completely unknown outside of the Bible. And for this reason, skeptics often mocked the Bible and said, well, that's a made-up story. There was never any such thing as the Hittites. Of course, now we know better. It wasn't until the early 1900s that the capital of the Hittite Empire was discovered and the Bible was proven correct once again. The book of Daniel was criticized uh, for a number of uh, things along this line and was criticized for calling Belshazzar the final king of Babylon. If you know your Bible, you know there's a whole story connected with how Babylon fell. But secular history from the ancient Greeks all the way down to modern times said that's not true. Belshazzar was uh, not the king. His father was the final king. But recently, archaeological carvings have demonstrated that Belshazzar ruled alongside his father because his father spent 10 years out in the field fighting a military campaign against the Arabians. So the Bible is accurate because Belshazzar said, Daniel, I'm going to make you the third ruler in the kingdom. The Bible was accurate, even though historians up until just a few years ago did not realize what that verse was talking about. In the New Testament, Luke records very accurately the geography of the Roman Empire and even mentions extremely accurately the different types of officials that existed in particular towns, many of which had their own form of government. The more you dig in and do research, the more the Bible is shown to be accurate in matters of history and geography. The Bible is prophetically accurate. It has prophetic accuracy. You know, unlike the books of other religions, the Bible has an amazing track record of predicting the future. And over the centuries, you heard Brian allude to it, many detailed prophecies were given to the Hebrew prophets which have come to pass. And these were not vague poems like Nostradamus that you have to figure out. Well, I think he's talking about a lion. I think he's talking about a snake. It's not like that. The prophecies of the Bible are very descriptive and clear statements. Ezekiel foretold hundreds of years in advance exactly how the city of Tyre would be destroyed and conquered later on hundreds of years after, the, after its initial destruction by Alexander and even described the exact method that Alexander would use to conquer the city. Prophecies were given to Daniel which accurately foretold the rise and fall in sequence of various empires. Of course, where we see this most clearly is in the prophecies concerning Jesus. There were dozens, even hundreds of prophecies, I should say, fulfilled by Jesus, including many prophecies over which Jesus and his followers had no control and would not be able to influence. The Old Testament prophets foretold the time and place of Jesus' birth and many other details concerning his life and his death. There is not any other book which claims to be supernatural which has this prophetic track record. So we can be confident that the Bible is reliable and that it was crafted by a supernatural mind. The Bible also has scientific accuracy. We know the Bible is not a book of science, but yet it does not make any scientific mistakes. Genesis does not give us a scientific explanation for the creation of the world necessarily, but it does not say anything that is untrue or unscientific. Did you know that the writers of the Bible knew a great many things about the universe which modern science did not discover until our era or almost our era? Do you know in the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible, it may be as much as 3,800 years old, and that's old. It is clear from the book of Job that the writer knew that there were currents in the ocean. 
which is something that we did not understand until the 1700s. Now, how do they know that? The Bible writers knew that the wind circulated and did not blow in a straight line and that there were mountains and channels under the sea. When we read about Isaiah, did you know the Hebrews did not believe that the earth was flat? They didn't. Isaiah says that the earth is, uh, it talks about God sitting above the circle of the earth, and it talks about how the earth hangs in space and is suspended by nothing. That's what Isaiah said. Jesus said that when he came, some would be found working in the fields and some would be found asleep in their beds. The Jews knew from the word of God that the earth is round. Some major religions believe ridiculous things about the world. The Quran says that the world is flat and the mountains are pinning it down, holding it down. And Hindu texts talk about serpents holding up the world. But a reader of the Bible never has to worry that he will be embarrassed about something that is in the Bible. So the Bible is not a textbook of science, but it will never contradict the nature of the reality that we see around us. Second reason why the Bible is reliable is because it's believable as literature. It has believability. I did not say the Bible is credible to people who don't believe in the supernatural. For example, the Bible teaches us that Jesus rose from the dead. Many people make conclusions about that, not because of the strength of the evidence for or against the resurrection, but because they don't believe a resurrection is possible. But what I mean about believability is that when we look at the Bible subjectively, we see that the Bible has integrity. It has the ring of truth to it. The Bible does not mythologize its heroes. We see Bible heroes, if you want to call them that, complete with all of their flaws and their warts. Even its very best are people like us. Only Jesus is portrayed as spotless. Even the apostles are human beings with all the weaknesses that human beings share. When the Bible speaks as history, it feels like a real history. When the Bible speaks as biography, it feels like a real biography. It's the words of regular men and women that we're reading, and we're reading their honest emotions, not an airbrushed version of their lives. It's also literature of the first quality, and despite its age, it obviously moves us with immense beauty and with its unforgettable stories. You know, in other religions, the human founders of the religion are meant to be examples which everyone should follow. That's very different from the New Testament where we see Paul standing up to Peter because Peter was wrong. When people make up a holy book, they don't provide honesty of that type, but they paint all the leaders in the best possible light the way that cult leaders do. The Bible is very believable as literature. Third reason we know the Bible is reliable is because of its consistency. The Bible does not contradict itself. And that's remarkable when we consider what Brian said, how the Bible was authored by many people across the centuries and in many places. And despite that, the authors are portraying the same God who has the same character and the same purpose. Dozens of different authors telling you the same story. It's Maybe 66 books, but it's really one book with one message, the story of redemption. Fourth reason a Bible is reliable is because of its delivery, the means by which it was transmitted to us. People believe that the Bible is the word of God, and so they handled it with the greatest care and precision. The world owes a tremendous debt to the Jewish people that can never be calculated because of the way in which they transmitted the scriptures down. The, the word of God and the name of God were held in such reverence by them that the scribes, it is said, would actually stop copying, stop writing, and take a bath every time they wrote the word of God. Can you imagine that? Because of the delivery of scripture as well as God's supernaturally guarding it through time, the Christian can be completely confident that the Bible Bible is reliable. Jesus said that not one jot or tittle of the law can be broken. And those were the two little smallest flourishes or marks on letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So Jesus is making an important point. Every letter of the scripture is vital. And Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. God preserves his word supernaturally, right? Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Lots of other things we could say to you about the reliability of the Bible, but we just wanted to share share those with you to give you confidence in the word of God. And a fourth question just to, to wrap up before we go into our group time tonight is why should we read the Bible? 
Why should we read the Bible? First, because it is revelation from God. We need the Bible if for no other reason than that it is God speaking to us in its pages. We spoke last week about how God had revealed himself to humanity, and the Bible is one of the major ways, of course, that he does that. It's God giving a record of himself and of who he is. It explains his will, his character, what he expects from mankind, and how we should live our lives. It tells us how to recognize his Messiah, how to be in good standing with God, and it reveals what he wants us to know about the future. It lays out for us the past, present, and future of the human race from the most accurate perspective possible, which is the point of view of the person who made us. Second, we read to be acquainted with Christ. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Jesus said the scriptures testify about him. They preserve for us his words and, and the record of his sufferings and resurrection. And the rest of the New Testament explains for us the salvation that Jesus won. What does it mean to be a Christian, and who is Jesus within us? It was one of the medieval saints who said, to be ignorant of the scriptures is to be ignorant of Christ. And if you live in the scriptures, as Brian was talking about, you will know Jesus better and better every day, and you will fall more in love with him all the time. We also read scripture to renew our mind. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We must change our thinking so that our thinking no longer conforms to the destructive path of this world. The Bible will straighten out your mind and it will reshape your thinking. It will help you to think soundly and become a wise person. It will supernaturally make you smart and make you a clear thinker more than you ever thought possible. If you're the type of person that people have said about you, you know, what's wrong with you? You just don't think straight then let the Bible renew your mind. God promises you, if you meditate in his word, you'll have good success. We also read the scripture to learn the ways of God. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, I believe we need to take the posture of children before God, that we really don't know how to live. If we approach his word, I think with humility, we will see God in there teaching us how to live and how to act in so many different areas of life. Number five, we read the word for sanctification. Psalm 119 says, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed to it according to your word? In the Bible, we can compare the word of God to a piece of furniture that they had in the ancient world that was called a laver, L-A-V-E-R. That was something like a modern bathroom vanity. It was a basin that had a mirror attached to it. And you could look in that mirror and see your flaws. You could see what needed to be washed and then reach down into the water and wash yourself. And the Bible has that function in our lives. It asks us, how can we cleanse our way? And we do that by taking heed to the word of God, by paying attention to the way we're walking according to his word. And as we look into his word, we can see God's character and God's holiness there. We can see where we fail to measure up, and then we go to the Lord, and he cleanses us from those things. So think of the Bible as uh, a bathroom vanity sent to you from God, and you'll get the picture of what that's about. Number six, quickly, to grow in faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, it says in Romans 10, 17. The Bible builds faith into us. You see, when you know what God has to say about a subject, your faith about that thing will increase. If you need faith to believe God about your financial problems, your health problems, or many other things that we can't measure tangibly, like peace, contentment, knowing that you're forgiven, the Bible will encourage you. For example, if you read the Bible and study what God says about healing, you will have more faith to believe that God will heal you and heal others when you pray for them. God will convince you out of his own mouth that he's in favor of healing. So thinking about the wonderful promises that God makes to people encourages us. And when we think about those promises, when we meditate on them, faith is built into our hearts. And finally, I want to leave you with this. We read the Bible because it's the daily bread for our spirits. God told Joshua in Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. 
when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the desert, he supplied them every day with bread. When they woke up and went outside their tent, it was waiting for them. And all they had to do was bend down and pick it up off the ground. It didn't last until the next day. They couldn't store it up. They had to go and pick it up off the ground every morning. And you know, it's the same thing with God's word. God's word is food like that for our hearts. It encourages us. It renews our mind. It builds up our faith. And it reveals constantly more and more to me about the God I love. And I need to feast on it every day. And I need to eat it like bread from heaven, which is what it is, just as the children of Israel ate the bread that came down to them from heaven every day. And that beautiful passage from Joshua reminds us that as we spend time in the word, as we read the Bible and take it to heart, God's blessing and God's reward will come to us. And uh, that's what we wanted to share tonight. We're going to move into our discussion time now. And if you don't have a Bible, I do encourage you to pick one up tonight. We also have some books that we're going to make available uh, to you for purchase. It's a nice little guide to the Bible. It's called You and Your Bible. And we'll be uh, selling that in the back of the room. I'm also going to give you homework. First, I want to start asking you to read your Bible. And uh, next week, Pastor Glenn and our friend Jeff Querfeld, they will be sharing about creation and the fall of man. And so I want to ask everyone to read the first two chapters of Genesis during the next week. Read Genesis chapter 1 and 2. If you have a hard time finding those chapters, you can ask somebody in your group. This, is, is that funny? I don't know. Some may not know. So the second thing that we should begin to do is to start journaling. Your journal is your spiritual diary. Everyone should have a journal in which you write down what is happening in your life spiritually. What are you learning? What are you thinking about? What are you going through? What are you praying about and praying for? We think that will be a great blessing to you and it will help you to grow. So thanks for your attention tonight and uh, enjoy your group time together and don't forget your homework. <laughs>